Hello, everyone. Uh, I welcome as well to our final panel of the summer for the love of music, the disabled fans perspective. I'm Valerie Gritch and I use she, her pronouns. I'm calling from Matinecock land that was colonized in the 17th century to eventually become Queens, New York City. For anyone who can't see me, I'm a 31 year old white woman with mid-length blue curly hair. I'm wearing a black top and I'm sitting in front of a, white, a light blue wall. I'm currently serving as the vice president of Half Access. We are a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to making live music more accessible. I'll be your moderator for today's panel in our final summer series. And it's called From the Crowd to the Stage. After today's panel, we will be hosting a discussion space for all attendees on our Discord server if you'd like to join. We'd like to thank Music Portland for running tech for this series and Hopeless Records and Subcity for sponsoring it. ASL interpretation for today is provided by Steffi and Selena from Fingers Crossed Interpreting. Closed captions are available by turning them on at the bottom of your screen. And unfortunately, due to scheduling conflicts, um, panelists Mackenzie Holloway, and at the moment, Kelly will not be able to join us. For today's panel on the disabled fan experience, we are joined by an awesome group, and I can't wait to hear their insight. With that, I'll allow them to introduce themselves. And since we're all fans of music here, we'd love it if you could also share some of your favorite artists that you're a fan of. Ty, do you want to start with us? Sure, I'll start. Uh, my name is Ty Dykema. I use he, him pronouns. I'm calling from Grand Rapids, Michigan. That's on the west side of Michigan. Um, I am a white man in my electric wheelchair. I have blonde hair, red glasses, and a black shirt on. Um, right now, some of my favorite bands are The Menzingers and Turnstile. Um, yeah, here in Michigan, I, I am an artist, a writer, and I make zines. Awesome. Carly, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, sorry. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Carly Webster. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am from the Dayton, Ohio area. Um, I am the creator of the Disabled Sauce Project, um, which is a fan project or um, volunteer organization, whatever you want to um, think of it as, um, that is dedicated to um, making disabled fans feel included and supported and um, kind of handling more of the fandom um, side of the music industry. Um, for anyone who may not be able to see me, I have um, short brownish hair. Um, I'm a white woman with a black half axis shirt on and um, gray wall. Awesome. And since I'm jumping in to fill some of the slack, I will do the same. Um, when I'm not Working with Half Access, I work with uh, record labels and artists doing social media and fan engagement um, and a ton of other things. Fandom is the reason I live and breathe. Uh, I, it's why I got into working with music. I study fandom academically. I just got my master's degree in fan studies. Um, I am obsessed with fandom and being a fan. And my favorite artist is Frank Turner who I have seen live over 130 times. <laughs> oh gosh. Wow. I'm a little proud, but I'm also a little ashamed. So it's lots of fun here. <laughs> you should be proud. That's awesome. <laughs> OK, let us dive into the first official question. Um, in what ways is live music a part of your life? And how does your disability affect your experience within it? Carly, do you want to kick us off? Uh, yeah, um, like I said, I've, you know, been involved in fandoms um, for quite a few years. Um, I kind of came back to Stan Twitter, I guess, um, in uh, 2016, um, summer 2016. And um, that was just before um, my first Five Seconds of Summer show. That is my favorite band, by the way. Um, and so that's kind of allowed me um, to connect with a lot of people. Um, and as far as um, my disability, um, it just kind of 
um, it, it makes, um, sorry, I'm like blanking right now. Um, it, I have to make sure that, um, especially at GA gigs, um, that like my walker is stable, but now I have like an upgraded one that um, I'm gonna be able to have brakes and everything on now. Um, but I just need to make sure that I'm getting like sitting breaks every once in a while, that I'm drinking plenty of water, um, usually after gigs um, because I don't stretch, which I should. Um, usually my legs hurt quite a bit, you know, my ankles might swell up, but um, I guess I could say that I'm a little bit, um, a little bit more on the like able side in terms of, you know, being able to um, go in pits and stuff like that, which I am extremely, extremely grateful for because I know not everyone has that um, opportunity, but I am grateful for it. And it's something that I um, really enjoy. Yeah, so I want me to go next. Of course. Awesome. Uh, so I'm 31 now, but long before I was like booking shows and throwing events myself, I've just always been going to shows, especially oh, when I started going to shows, I was probably like 14 or 15 years old. So live music has always been like a really big part of my life. I think I've gone Outside of a pandemic, I've been going to shows pretty much weekly since I was like 15 or 16. So um, yeah, but being a wheelchair user, it does affect my uh, relationship with live music in a pretty big way. Um, you know, as I was going to more and more shows, I realized how much uh, of the spaces were inaccessible, at least like, at least partially inaccessible and like, um, so yeah, in like my 20s, I started really uh, getting involved in booking and promoting and trying to make uh, at least my city more aware of what the accessibility options were like in the venues here and trying to work with those venues to make those spaces more accessible. That is awesome. Uh, yeah, thanks. I kind of have a very similar uh, story to the both of you where music is just everything to me. And I, st I think my first concert was when I was seven. And then I started going to shows more regularly from the age of 13, um, from local shows to, you know, really big artists and stuff like that. And when I was 16 is when all of my health issues started. So that's when I, was, I started to have experiences with chronic pain and needing accommodations of some kind. And my problem was that, you know, nobody tells you that these things exist, that accommodations exist. Mm -hmm. And I spent so many years hating myself and also hating this thing that I loved because I wasn't able to experience it the way that I had previously, the way that my friends were, and it was actively harming me in, at the same time. And even today, even with accommodations, it's a, a toss up of, if I go to this show, I might you know, trigger one of my chronic illnesses or something and have a flare. And then I might be really sick for a week or so afterwards and it's like, is it worth it to feel this crappy? Is this band like worth it for me to, to suffer <laughs> potentially? Yeah. Um, and it's just, you know, constantly weighing those options. And that's just, you know, my own internal struggle, not even dealing with, um, you know, issues with venues or other people and stuff like that. And there's always, unfortunately, issues, if not with the venues, than with other people and, you know, people giving you dirty looks if they let you jump the line to get situated inside early or, you know, making snarky comments, asking invasive questions and things like that. And yeah, like, give me a break, people. <laughs> Mind your business. I, I totally relate to that. Like, I feel like sometimes there's preparing for a show, which could be days or even weeks leading up to it, you know, whether you're tracking down like accessibility um, uh, information about the venue or whatever, but then there's 
actually being in that show and how tiring that can be. And then there's like days or weeks of recovery afterwards. You know what I mean? So I totally relate to that. Yeah. Um, I And I can say for sure that I've had like a worse experience with actually like other fans being, you know, not as accepting of it than I actually have with the venues. And, you know, other people might have different experiences, but like I can just remember several experiences where, you know, again, I got dirty looks or something like that. Um, when at the end of the day, like it's all about everyone's safety and comfort. And I want everybody else to enjoy the show just as much as me. Um, you know, obviously, um, I probably wouldn't be asking for accommodations if I didn't. Um, obviously, it might be a bit of a different situation, both after COVID and both with my like new walker, which is a lot different. Um, but yeah, it's 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 very, very easy to just be kind um, and not assume anything. And um, unfortunately, like this is just like such a, a taboo like topic that, you know, there's been whole like, um, you know, like discussions or like, like arguments on like social media um, over, you know, whether disabled fans should be allowed to like, you know, go in early or something like that. Um, and I don't think that should be something that's um, argued about um, because while I do understand that there might be some people out there who might try to um, kind of invade our space and like use our genuine needs to like, you know, get ahead for their own personal benefit. I, um, I do think there are way, way, way more of us that are actually genuinely um, in need of it. And I think um, we should kind of take the stance of, you know, believe this person first before you, you know, make any assumptions. Absolutely. I agree completely. There's so, like, I see it more online these days, of course, because obviously there's no, nothing holding you back from being snarky and rude online and the, the distance, the disconnect kind of gives people that sort of uh, empowerment to be meaner than they would necessarily in person. And I mean, just last month, I, it, there was a big thing I remember on Twitter about the disability community and, and a pop punk band. And it's just, it, it seems to be never ending that, you know, mm -hmm. even, even while we're all dealing with COVID and that we all should be way more aware of, you know, disability and how it intersects everything that mm -hmm. we're still having these discussions that we've been having for years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. So that leads us to our next question. Um, which is what's a good experience and a bad experience you've had with live music? And what do you want people to learn from those experiences? Ty, do you want to go first? Um, yeah, I'll go first. Um, I think my, I'll start with the bad one, if that's cool. Uh, it was one of, uh, I was a teenager, I was in high school, probably ninth or 10th grade. And my friends were playing a show and um, I went to it and it was down a flight of stairs. I had never heard of a house show before. And so I was definitely not prepared for there to be a flight of stairs when I got there. And uh, there was just no feasible way for me to get me safely down those stairs and let alone back up. And so I kind of just hung outside the house for a while until it just got like too uncomfortable and like awkward, like realizing like how I was not able to actually participate. And so I think, um, I think that was kind of where my, uh, my uh, drive to make things more accessible or at least like more clear on what accessibility is and isn't started. Uh, obviously, there's a lot to learn in in that uh, in that we need to be we need to be more clear on what places are and aren't accessible. Um, and then one of my favorite show going experiences was in summer of 2019. Um, 
I went and saw the Menzingers at my favorite venue, uh, which is here in Grand Rapids. It's called the Pyramid Scheme. And it was my 100th show at the Pyramid Scheme, which I think uh, says all you need to know about how, how much I love that place. And part of the reason why I do love that place so much is because they are so very accessible and so accommodating and willing to listen. Um, and the staff had like known that it was going to be like my 100th show there. And so they like, even though it was like the Menzinger show, they had it like decorated for me and like a spot that I like to sit. And they had like the Menzingers shout me out. And I just, I felt like so um, empowered and loved in that situation and so comfortable because that venue is so accessible. It's really great. That is an incredible story. Thanks. Wow. What about you, Carly? Um, one great experience. I actually want to shout out a specific person um, for this. Um, but, um, I've actually had like this experience, like, I guess twice, um, but in 2018, um, on Five Sauces Meet You There tour, um, it was my first time, um, not my first time going to a GA show, but first time I'm um, having GA for Five Sauce. And if you have any idea about how, um, Five Sauce fans are, you will know that they're very passionate about, um, queuing and um, you know, getting barricade and stuff. And so um, at first it was kind of like meh because um, my parents weren't, I was only 15 at the time. My parents weren't really sure um, about letting me um, queue and like they definitely weren't letting me queue overnight, um, but they let me go at like seven in the morning. And so I was queuing all day and um, the, um, the band's VIP um, coordinator um, Angie, um, she actually had, um, uh, both for soundcheck and the show, um, she had, um, security escort me, um, to barricade to make sure that I didn't have to deal with the rush of people, um, uh, and everything like that. And, you know, um, she, between, um, soundcheck and the show, she let me and my friend, um, sit down, like, um, uh, like the gate was like here and everybody was like in line here, like on the other side of the gate um, so that we just didn't have to like get back in line and everything. Um, and she was so, so sweet, um, so nice. And then um, she kind of did the same for me um, that next year. It wasn't Five Sauces tour, but um, it was the Chainsmokers tour and they were um, playing on it. But um, actually it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily her that like arranged it but both of the venues that I went to for that tour were super um great and like had um people like specifically um escort me so that was nice um I would say that a bad experience um I I mean I, I actually it, it's kind of a good thing because I haven't had um that many um bad experiences but I just say like the the looks and stuff is the main thing um but there was one experience that I went to or that I had um where it was it was kind of a um a smaller venue it was only like three or four hundred cap at max um and um the way that I ended up in that like pit which I kind of am mad at myself or even like making a deal out of this, but um, uh, like I was, I kind of ended up against this um, like garage door, um, and it was super uncomfortable. I was kind of in pain because everything was like pushing up against me. It was kind of tight, um, and my walker was like I. I guess it was kind of me just trying to kind of get closer. Um, there wasn't really a barricade. There's more of just like a it's more, it's like a bar. So it's more of just like, um, a edge or whatever. Um, but my walker, like, wasn't really even around me. It was more of like behind me. Um, and I'm not going to go into it just because again, I feel like it, I maybe shouldn't have, um, said anything, but it was just, 
people were kind of being nasty and um, it was kind of an uncomfortable um, experience. I think that was more related to my own experience, my own like decisions than it was like accessibility. Um, but yeah, um, it's, um, yeah, I, I guess that was kind of a bad-ish experience, I guess. <laughs> But I mean, if I can piggyback off of that real quick, um, I think that kind of is a perfect example because that kind of says like, uh, all you need to know about like what needs to be improved, like there needs to be better viewing areas uh, for people of all different uh, abilities and disabilities. Like the fact that you got pinned against this wall when you were trying to just be a little bit closer like maybe there should have already been like a safer area for you to be in that was closer so wait you didn't have to have an experience like that yeah and what actually ended up happening um was um i again like i was like 15 i was mm -hmm. being very immature at the time i was very insistent on being barricade or like front row or whatever but um, they actually, security actually ended up moving me to the side, which it was obviously a less crowded. Like I was able to actually move, mm -hmm. but like, there was like a, like not a wall, but like a, like a pillar in front of me. Um, mm -hmm. so I couldn't really see all that well, but one of the band members actually ended up like coming over to me and getting, giving me, um, a pick and a set list. And, um, so I guess, um, I was kind of, I guess, seen either way, or maybe somebody found out um, about the situation. But, um, but yeah, uh, yeah, it was. De it's is definitely one of those tinier venues that um, you kind of can't um, really count on to be super like spacious or anything like that because yeah. they're, you know, they're trying to cram, you know, two or three hundred people in a room. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm glad I, they ended up being good to you in the end. So. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what we love to see, like, at least. Unfortunately, we know that not everybody can be as accessible as we would like them to be. But when there is an issue that they do make an attempt to fix it, because yeah. so many venues just like in the moment, especially will double down on what it, they're doing or saying or not doing you know right and when you complain after the fact they were like well the next time you come we'll like contact us and things will be okay and it's like great but what about everybody else like yeah. i i enjoy having my needs met but there are countless others who don't have your personal contact number to arrange whatever so right. what do we do then and i mean my my answers to this question are very similar to yours, of, of course. <laughs> um, my worst experience was, um, and unfortunately I do have quite a few to, th to pick from, which is kind of upsetting, but I think one of the worst was I was at a venue in New York City that again, uh, similar to Carly, was a very small venue, maybe about 400 or 500 capacity. Um, a main floor area with a balcony up top, but the balcony can only be reached by stairs. I called in advance, I tried emailing, I tried harassing them on social media to just contact somebody and be like, I am disabled, I need an accommodation. And I heard nothing back, I couldn't get a hold of anybody. I finally get to the venue the day of, I get there early. The guy, the security guy is giving me a hard time. He doesn't want to call the manager down to speak to me. He keeps telling me that what I'm asking for, they can't do. And then finally somebody comes in and I'm like, you know, I can't stand for long periods of time. I need a, a seat. Um, so they get me a bar stool and they put me in a corner up against the wall, but it's, it's about in the mid, the middle of the room and I'm right where the mosh pit would have opened up for the main band and there's no barricade, no nothing between me and the crowd. So as the sold out show got more and more packed as the night went on, people kept crashing into me because I sitting on the bar stool, I was the height of other people standing. So they didn't realize I was sitting. 
I had, you know, drinks spilled on my legs, people crashing into me on the bar stool as the opening bands were playing, the crowd was pushing back into me. And I'm like, this is not safe. And they kept adding more and more people who were coming in who are asking for accommodations. So more and more bar stools kept getting put next to me. And then finally a wheelchair user came in and they said, okay, we're gonna move some of the people who can manage the stairs up to the balcony, but we're gonna keep the wheelchair user here where they wouldn't have been able to see with no barricade right next to where the mosh pit is going to inevitably open up. And it did open mm -hmm. up later. So they moved me up to the balcony, but then again, I didn't have anything around me to separate me from other people. So I had more drunk people like leaning on the back of the bar stool, holding onto the back, jumping up and down on it. So shaking the chair. And I'm like, literally my main problem is I have you know, four herniated discs in my back. And I'm like, can you not shake me? <laughs> um, it, like ev everything that happened to me that night was saying disabled people are an afterthought, if that. Um, and they yeah. are not a, a consideration. They're not a priority at this venue. And it was so upsetting. And it was one of my favorite bands. I was seeing the Gaslight Anthem. And it was a fantastic show. I wish I could have fully enjoyed it by not like, constantly being hyper vigilant of everyone and everything around me because yeah. I didn't trust everyone around me. I trust myself. <laughs> I don't trust everybody else. Yeah. On, the, on the flip side, there's another venue in New York that sadly I think closed because of all the COVID you know, delays and whatnot, um, but they were fantastic. And you know, they would see me standing in line with my cane or whatever, and they would bring out a folding chair for me to queue with. Um, they had an elevator that went right to a disabled uh, ADA viewing platform that was near the stage. You could see everything. You had great sound quality, but it was also like at the right level so you could feed off the energy from the crowd. And as lovers of live music, you guys know how important that is. Like yeah. hearing your favorite song like in your chest is such an important like moment to have. And when your view is blocked or you're being hyper vigilant that someone's going to knock into you and or you can't even get into the venue, like we're being robbed of these moments that we're essentially paying for in advance most of the time. And yeah. it's so, so frustrating. So mm -hmm. it's great when you find a venue that does actually consider disabled people and it's, awful <laughs> how many venues don't consider disabled people I think yeah yeah um go ahead I uh, just to kind of continue with what you said about like yeah uh how great it is when venues really do start to listen um and it kind of relates back to my first really bad experience actually uh, I have a good experience that's kind of on the flip side of that um couple years ago, there was a house venue here in Grand Rapids uh, that was very inaccessible, as most house venues usually are. Uh, the shows were played in the basement, um, but then I started getting more involved uh, in like promoting shows here and got to know the people that ran that house venue. And eventually together with a couple people in the community, we built ramps to get onto the first floor of the house and they started having the shows upstairs. So it was like, we kind of all made this house venue at least like mostly accessible. Uh, you could have like the shows upstairs and stuff. It was really cool. And that was because like they started listening to the needs of the community and we worked together on it. And it's a shame how rare that is. Yeah. But it's wonderful when it does happen. Right, like accessibility, like we, we don't always expect it to be perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of these buildings are already built a certain way and it's really hard, especially at like a DIY level to make them perfect. But like when the people that run them actually listen and work with the community, there's so much that we can do to make them at least better, you know? Absolutely. 
Let's do um, it. Oh, do you have something to add? Yeah. Um, go, kind of going off of what um, Ty said, but kind of um, on the flip side of it, um, something I had written down to like mention was the fact that especially with large arenas, um, we notice that they're named after these insurance companies, these corporations that have millions of dollars in their pockets. They have the capability of creating what they like to call, you know, state of the art venues and, you know, buildings. Um, but somehow that state of the artness does not include um, accessibility and, um, you know, uh, that, you know, even when people go to shows and ask about like their accessibility, like um, we, we might get excuses like, oh, this is just the way that the building was, you know, built. Um, but why, why does that have to be, um, you know, the only accessible seating being in the way back? Um, like I want, I, you know, obviously, you know, my experience is a little bit different um, because of, you know, my disability. But for people who actually need, you know, wheelchair seating or um, vision impaired um, or hearing impaired, you know, you, you want to be able to have the same experience as everyone else um, and not feel like your disability is the reason that you can't. Um, you know, there, I, I am a firm believer in the fact that there should be, for every section that's, you know, in that arena or whatever, there should be a certain amount of accessible seating. And um, one thing that I noticed, um, I think um, one time I was kind of just looking um, at some tickets um, for Five Sauces No Shame Tour. And um, this was one of the shows that I was gonna end up going to before like things got rescheduled and stuff. Um, but it was like the first like, it was at an amphitheater so like the first like the 100 section was pretty much like all the way sold out um but there were some at the back and um they were at first marked as accessible like companion seating but then later on they took that label away and just marked them as regular seats now i understand if no one is like wanting those or contacting you about accessibility, but what if there's someone months later who actually needs that and now yeah. where are they, you know? Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's in the name of just making a profit and shows that, um, you know, these venues, these corporations do not care. They just want the money, okay, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe um, some artists or, um, you know, people who are, um, I guess, uh, more closer to the fans, like lower down in the industry might care a little bit more. Um, but, you know, the venue is always like the first stop, you know, um, especially when we've got these big artists who, you know, trying to get a hold of them is, you know, like, you know, I, I don't even know what to compare it to, but, um, you know, um, even just if you try to reach out to like the artist or someone that you know about um you know accessibility they're like oh you have to talk to the venue um and regardless of how how closely related um that venue might be to a corporation it's yeah like I said it's always about the cash and um I don't think that um disabled people um, should have their experiences like taken away or downgraded um, at that sort of expense or at, at the expense of their own um, comfort. Um, and like like Valerie said, you know, you have herniated discs and if people shake you, you could be in pain. And that's that, you know, no show is worth that. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I just, you know, it, it's different like with Ty's situation where that was a house show. It was kind of like locally owned the community was able to come together and do something. But like when we're going against, you know, an example that I had thought of earlier was like State Farm Arena Atlanta, you know, State Farm, they're not gonna listen to someone like me, you know, they're, they're just there for the insurance and a little bit other, little bit else. Um, so, you know, it's, we, I guess, you know, 
kind of, you can take Ty as an example, we have to work from the communities up. We have to work with who we know and who we know cares and then somehow try to make our impact um, bigger from there. Um, but yeah, it's just, it, it's like, you know, we're just, we're just not being heard no matter how much we, we you know, scream. And so um, I, I think there's some people who might, um, you know, act as if, you know, COVID was kind of like a wake up call. Um, and it's like, you know, even I think earlier, maybe like, I don't remember when, but I had one point seen like um, a festival that was being held or at least proposed that everybody was on these like platforms that are where a certain distance apart. Um, and everybody's, oh, like, OMG, this is so great when that's what we've been asking for for yeah. forever. Um, so it's those suddenly pictures, able-bodied people are getting that. the exact thing that we have wanted. Um, so yeah. Yeah, those pictures of that festival actually showed up in my time hub today because oh um, those went up online and everyone, people were either freaking out saying, this is the dream, I want this, or this is not how punk show should be and making fun of it. And it was in my time hop because I had posted on Facebook and Twitter being like, yo, this is not the take you think it is. That's really ableist. Like mm -hmm. you can still enjoy punk music or whatever kind of music while you're sitting down. <laughs> like no matter what position you are in, you can enjoy music and you are allowed to do that. Like this is not the coolness, the cool take you think it is. Like, yikes. Right. <laughs> Like, what, do you, being, what do you think people do at home? They sit down and enjoy music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People's view on like what the music fan is so skewed and so narrow-minded, right? Like, kind of like you said, Carly, um, like these venues, the, especially these big venues that are out of touch with the community, like they just don't think that disabled music fans are out there. And so they like limit the accessibility because they don't think that people are actually going to use it. And then like, they're constantly just restricting it instead of expanding it. And then wondering like why we're not there. It's because right. like you're, it's not that we're not out there. It's that you're literally taking away our access to experiencing that. Well, I'm going to piggyback off of this um, and ask what information do you wish you could have before going to a venue? Or what do non-disabled people have to keep in mind as venues and tours begin again this fall? Who wants to start, Carly? Um, I think um, the first kind of thing that I thought of um, was that not everybody's situation is the same. Um, you know, for example, I am, you know, pretty much perfectly able of going into a pit, but somebody else who might look exactly like me or maybe not with a walker or whatever, you know, they might need to hang out at the back of the pit, you know, um, it's, you know, you can never assume, especially with, um, invisible disabilities and, um, you know, I think, like I've said earlier, um, I think people do have the fear that someone is lying or trying to take advantage of it. Um, but I personally, I would rather um, give somebody the opportunity um, that might be lying than, um, you know, decline someone an opportunity that really, really does need it. Um, so definitely that and just um, keeping in mind that we're not trying to take away from your experience. We're just trying to make ours comfortable um, and I think in regards to information, um, just, you know, I think in terms of accessibility information, I think it should just go beyond, okay, our seats are here, or, you know, if you, you know, if you need an interpreter, this is how you, you know, get one. Um, and I think it goes way beyond that, especially for people like me, like I might need to be escorted into the pit, so I'm not, you know, trampled. Um, so I need to know if that is something that can be done. Um, and obviously like with a couple of the venues that I've had a really good experience with that I've, you know, been smart and like 
um, you know, contacted them, you know, a month or so before, sometimes more than that, just to be sure. Um, but like, I need, you know, in case there is no contact information or whatever, I need to know, is that something that is, can be done? Or am I going to have to settle for being somewhere else in the venue? And I'm, not, I'm not saying that like anywhere else in the venue is not perfectly done and you can't have an experience there. But it, I'm saying if, if I'm able to do something, I want to be able to do it. You know, I'm not going to um, let myself be um, limited um, because, you know, I, I'm, 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 I want to take, um, you know, what I am able to do and um, just, you know, run with it, you know, um, just d do as much as I can. Um, you know, um, it, it's just really, it's really that easy um, to put it on a venue's website or something like that. And yeah, it may be, maybe not is, it's maybe not um, something super conventional or um, usual that you hear of, um, but it's definitely something that does exist, at least in my experience. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, I think, I think it's just a matter of respect and just thinking of people, um, you know, that, that may have a different, um, situation and way of enjoying music. So. Yeah, I think Carly said it best when you said, um, that you wanted non-disabled people to realize that like not everyone's experience is the exact same and that everyone's needs are the exact same to have those experiences. Um, for me, I really like when bands and venues are really transparent with their promotion. Uh, something we've been doing that's been really expanding here in West Michigan is a lot of the bands and venues I've been working with have been putting right on their promotional materials, it's even like the gig posters, they'll put like if a venue is wheelchair accessible or not. And I realize that that's not like all encompassing either, but like it gives you some sort of signifier that they're trying and that maybe like, and usually I should say, when those uh, bands and venues will put that on their promotional material, if you go to like either the website or like the Facebook event, there's like more detailed um, accessibility information so for me, it's about transparency. Like, even if you're not accessible in some way or another, like, you can just say that. Like, it would save, like, disabled fans so much time and energy trying to track that information down. Or like when I was a teenager and had that first experience going to a, a house show that was down a flight of stairs. Like, if that was just somewhere to be found, I wouldn't have shown up and felt, you know, so left out and embarrassed. Like, so yeah, for me, it's just about transparency. No, I totally agree. And I think that's why uh, what Cassie started here with Half Access with the database, I think is so important because uh, I think people really take for granted that they don't need to know all this information that the disabled community might need to know to go to a concert and it's like you know it's it's just not something they think about even though we're 25 percent of the population in the united states so very likely if not you then somebody that you're very close to has a disability of some kind and might need an accommodation and yeah. just putting like you said ty like even if you're not you know a pillar of accessibility even just saying that, you know, we have these accommodations or there is a flight of stairs or, you know, putting that information out there, giving us in, like the chance to actually be informed and saving us all that mental and emotional labor that we have to put into even figuring out if we can go to a show, um, it would be incredible. <laughs> and mm -hmm. with COVID, you know, it's, it's the same thing for me where tours are being announced and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, but what's going on? Like, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. I'm high risk, uh, you know, I'm vaccinated. I'm still wearing a mask everywhere, but are you requiring vaccinations? Are you requiring masks at your show? Is it a full capacity show? 
you know, what does sold out mean? Is it full capacity or are you only selling like 75 or 50% of tickets? Like Mm -hmm. how nervous should I be? (laughs) Like, because now that's a whole other risk on top of, you know, weighing the risk of being in physical pain and discomfort from my disability at a concert. Now I have to weigh the risk of potentially exposing myself to COVID. And it, it would just be really nice to know this information. And I'm glad so many artists are starting now to be like, oh yeah, you can't come if you don't have a vaccination or if you're not wearing masks because mm-hmm. that's what they should have been doing all summer. <laughs> but we <laughs> We got there in the end. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so hopefully we'll start getting there with just uh, the other normal accessibility uh, information that we need as well, whether there's uh, ramps or some other accessible entrance or accessible bathrooms or whatever. Like that stuff should be normally talked about when promoting different shows. Absolutely. Um, So this ties into our next question very nicely, which is how can artists and non-disabled fans better the experience of live music for you? And I feel like we've touched on this a bit with all of our other answers so far, Mm -hmm. but anything else you'd like to add to that? I would definitely like to say um, that whether or not you believe it, language matters. Um, You know, I've, I've seen um, even experiences with my own favorite band, um, whether intentional or not, you know, there's some, you know, ableist language, like um, asking the crowd to jump or something like that, or to, if you're not like standing up, then, you know, you're, you're, you know, not cool or whatever, you know, Um, I think it's, it's very subtle and definitely in most cases it it is not intentional, um, but it just makes things feel more inclusive because not everybody there is going to be standing up regardless if it's a parent just taking their kid to the show and not being interested or it's a disabled fan who literally cannot stand up at all um, because they're like in a wheelchair or they're having a bad pain day whatever it might be Um, but it's it yeah Um, and I think I think others might agree with me um, on this, but, you know, when we, you know, saw all these live streams happening with COVID, um, I think that is also something that can very easily be done um, by a lot of artists that maybe aren't like indie mm-hmm. or aren't um, just starting up who have the funds and the ability um, to stream all of their shows. And even if it was something like, okay, um, you pay like five dollars or whatever or even just the price of a regular ticket and you can you know watch the show via live stream and it'll be like you know because whether or not like you believe this like there's going to be some people who can't go at all you know they they could be perfectly you know capable of standing up or something but you know they're still scared of the risk of covid they um maybe or get overstimulated by um like the sounds and lights and everything like that you know you never know um so I think it's it's important to offer that resource for those that may need it and um we should definitely normalize having um those streams um definitely not for just like special you know big shows like maybe they've sold out a really um famous venue or something like that it should be more than that um definitely um and you know if you if you've got the money um to like especially you know we we see bands like filming documentaries at shows well why can't you basically have the same thing on a smaller scale um Mm -hmm. so that everybody can enjoy um the show from anywhere um and yeah it's because a lot of the times it's and i you know obviously i'm not assuming anybody's situation and it's definitely Um, different for everyone but I think there's more of among the disabled community um, less of a financial issue and more of just an accessibility issue Um, so it's not like someone wouldn't be able to like afford a ticket it's just a matter of okay this venue is not accessible I do have the money to go but I just can't Um, you know 
it, and the reality is is that there's going to be financial issues uh, unfortunately and that there still might be people that wouldn't be able to even afford a live stream and you know that's completely fine um unfortunately we live in a um capitalistic world mm -hmm. <laughs> so um you know there's always going to be stuff like that but i think that is just a small step that we can take um and i think that would be um beneficial and impactful for a lot of people and um mm -hmm. you know captions are a whole other discussion um because people just find it so hard to do that when they can easily even find it you know a disabled person or someone who is you know deaf or hard of hearing that has that knowledge when it's so just easy to just you know especially with the the, the internet communication that we use nowadays um you know it's just it's so easy and people just don't want to put um the effort in so um yeah it's like again small steps small steps <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh like Carly said, I, I really think that streaming should continue. Um, there's a lot of talk about like hybrid shows, you know, where like the, the venues will still have fans in them, even at, even once we're out of the pandemic, you know, like full capacity shows. I don't know why you can't also stream, like even on a, on a smaller uh, scale like I'm very much in, involved in like the DIY space and some of my friends bands are starting to have shows again which is really cool and some of those bands like yeah they don't have the money or the funding that like these larger bands do but nowadays almost everybody has a smartphone and almost everybody has access to some sort of social media and almost all of those social medias have live uh, video on them and so a lot of my friends' bands are just starting to have like a designated friend or fan stream the whole thing on their phone and just like send the homies the link or do it on Facebook or Twitch or whatever. And like, I, it doesn't have to be perfect, like I said, but like for me, I think the biggest thing bands and non-disabled fans can do is to just like try like try to be more accessible and try to be more conscious of like the people around you. You know, there's uh, the phrase, um, if you see something, say something. Well, like if you see something, maybe do something too. You know, uh, Carly earlier was talking about how she was pinned against that door. And like, luckily a staff member had come and helped you, but like, what if those people that were pinning you instead thought, let me help this awesome person enjoy this experience a little bit more? And like, yeah, I, it just comes down to a community trying better for me. No, I, I agree with everything that you all have said just now. <laughs> uh, I'm here for more streaming. I think it's like a, a no brainer that this is something that should continue, even if you just do it for one show per tour, you know, yeah. I, I, I would very easily pay good money because even if it's a, t a show that I went to in person, if it's a, a band I really like, yeah, I'm going to pay to watch the stream again and, you know, yeah. relive it and, you know, enjoy it and stuff like that. And also like, a, like, obviously there's so many kinds of music and so many kinds of music communities, but especially with like the punk rock alternative sort of uh, community that I, I believe we're all, you know, straddling in, um, you know, so much of that is based on these notions of looking out for one another and stuff like that. But it, like, we still don't get looked out for by so many people. And that's a shame because, you know, it, yes, we should be accommodating everybody. And it's great that these spaces are becoming more and more inclusive, but it's just really depressing when it's disabled people who, you know, just dis disability intersects every identity, we're still being left behind and we're the last ones in as it were. Um, and that's, that's just so disappointing. So I agree with everything y'all said. Um, awesome. Let's quickly get to our last question. Um, 
what advice do you guys have for other disabled people who are interested in going to shows? Um, definitely just, um, you know, like I, I, I understand it's so hard asking for accommodations and knowing the backlash that might um, occur, but just, you know, you know, if you're confident in your disability and you are passionate about music, just, just go for it, just go for it. Um, because, you know, if, if, you know, if you say something that could get you so much closer to having a better experience. Um, and just, you know, it's, it's easy to say, don't be afraid. Um, but trust me when I say that there are people who, even if it's, you know, right there beside you or on the internet, there are people that have your back and that will always defend you and support you. And, um, you know, that are, you know, on the front lines um, fighting for better accessibility and making sure that um, we're just able to, you know, access and enjoy um, live music and music as a whole, um, just like everyone else. Um, because we are people too and music, I will always stress this, music is so universal and so versatile and so, you know, just everyone can relate to it in some way. And um, I think we should all be able to enjoy that, whether it's, um, you know, in our bedrooms at home or um, in our favorite venue. So um, just don't be afraid um, to shoot your shot and don't be afraid to, you know, get, get, get nasty you know because we've we've dealt with you know so much like in the real world even outside of um you know live music and I think this is what we deserve and um if people can't understand that that is their issue and not um anything that's about us so just you know you know be loud and um don't don't let people silence you Well, personally, I think disabled people are the most creative. So my advice to disabled people trying to uh, go to shows or even just be involved is to get creative. You know how it is. Uh, disabled people have to adapt and um, we're pros at it. You know, we're, we're survivors. We make things work. And I think that can apply directly to shows. I think I'm uh, a living example of that, at least here in my city. Um, I've had to make things work and rally the community to make things uh, more accessible uh, for me and my disabled friends here. Um, sometimes the funding isn't there, but like if you can get the community together you can really pull a lot of stuff and get a lot of stuff done. So yeah, my advice is to be creative. I love it. Great advice from both of you there. So unfortunately we have reached the end of our time together, which makes me really sad because this was a great discussion. <laughs> um, just a reminder to everyone, we have an after panel discussion space if you would like to join us over on our Discord server. Um, whenever you feel motivated to come on over and share your thoughts, feel free, or additional questions that you have after listening to us chat, chat away. Um, thank you again to our fantastic panelists for sharing their stories with us today. Um, thank you to Music Portland for running tech and Hopeless and Sub City for sponsoring, to Steffi and Selena for interpreting, and thank you all, of course, for tuning into our final summer panel. We will be sharing a feedback form in the chat if you want to take a minute and fill it out, remember to get vaccinated and to keep wearing a mask. And thank you guys. And we hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much.